Welcome to There Is a Method to the Madness. My name is Rob Maxwell. I'm an exercise physiologist and personal trainer. I'm the owner of Maxwell's Fitness Programs, and I've been in business since 1994. I'm here in this podcast to talk to you about science. There's not enough science out there in the physical fitness industry, and that's what I'm here to do, to talk about the method to the madness, because there actually is methods that work, methods that are true and tested, and so that's what we are here to do. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about switching gears. How do we switch gears in that cardio? Let's talk about that because there's a lot of confusion into how to measure the intensity of our cardiorespiratory workouts. And I know I've talked about that before, but you know what? I'm going to talk about it again. And you know, before I get to that, let's let's talk about who our people are. You know, who are our guys? Don't we need that in all of our departments, they could be gals too, of course. So who are our peeps that we can trust, you know? Like who do we use for the handyman around the house? Who do we use for cars? Who do we use? We need all these types of people. And the one we need, the other one we need is a real estate agent. Who do you go to? Who's your go-to for that? Because they should be able to handle everything that you need And in my book, I trust Jonathan and Lynn Gilden of the Gilden Group at Realty Pros. They're my go-to people for whatever I'm looking for in real estate. And right now, it's a changing market. You need a true professional. So why don't you give them a shout if you're looking to sell, if you're looking to buy. 386-451-2412. All right. So now let's talk about some methods to the madness. So... Most people today have a smartwatch of sorts, whether it be a Garmin, whether it be an Apple Watch, whether it be a Fitbit. And, uh, you know, they've got some cool features. They've got some nice tools that help us. I really like the pedometer function on them. I like kind of tracking steps and kind of gets my lazy butt going if I look down and see that I might have exercised vigorously, but I haven't moved enough the rest of the day. So it helps me do that. I like that. I like the uh, GPS functions in them, you know, they really help me with my paces, whether I'm cycling or running, jogging, walking or whatever. And then the heart rate functions are pretty cool too. And it's really opened up a new world for people because, you know, really, gosh, I don't know, what are we looking at here? Maybe 10 years that these things are, are, have really taken off. But prior to that, people were just measuring their heart rate if they have like a polar heart rate monitor, or if we're really going old school, like back when I was in college and working in my, uh, you know, exercise physiology courses, you know, we really, we literally manually palpated pulses at the radial artery to figure out what the heart rate was. And we taught people how to do that. I mean, can you imagine like now people doing that? Like, I mean, they really did. So we would teach people how to do a count of 15 seconds and then, of course, multiply by four to get the pulse. This way, they're only staying stationary for 15 seconds. So people literally would stop and palpate their pulses. I mean, so so heart rate monitoring's come a long way. And then, of course, from that, we went into polar. I shouldn't say, of course, you may not know this. Uh, We went from palpating pulses to polar heart rate monitors became the thing, but that was only used by people that were pretty serious about endurance training. And they had the wireless straps that you put around your chest, and then it picked up the heart rate onto your wristwatch. You may have seen people do that. You may have had one. So people did have those, and you know people got pretty educated on how to use those. But see, now everybody has access to these things because you're wearing them on your watch, on your wrist. So like you may have never gone out and gotten a heart rate monitor before. My guess is most people wouldn't. But because they have that, because they have an Apple Watch, most likely Apple Watch because I think people that buy garments only get them for exercise. But people that get Apple Watches tend to use them for other things plus exercise. So, you know, you're probably would have never gotten one but now you do so you've got this nice little feature 
how do you use it? And I know that a lot of people do use it because most of the clients that we train, they'll put theirs on workout or they'll put theirs on functional training or they'll put it on other, speaking of Apple Watches here, and as they exercise, they'll watch their pulse. So they're curious about it. But how do we use it best for cardio? Because really, that is the best feature to use heart rate. Because while you're working out with weights, it's not as big of a factor. It tells you when you might need to recover a little bit, or it might tell you you need to pick it up a little bit. But the big value is in cardio. So let's get some of the science down. Now, all of the, the metrics that they use are based on observation. They're, they're based on theoretical concepts with people, and that's how they're setting your target heart rates. And each company does it slightly different. I notice Apple Watches, I only know this because I went back in to see how they set my numbers, and then I did some math, and I figured out what they were using for formulas. And they tend to use more what we call just maximal heart rate formula. And that means that they're not really using resting heart rate into the formula at all. So they tend to just use, from what I gathered in my math, the standard 60% to 70% to 80% to 90%, 100% of maximum heart rate. Now, what I have seen from Garmin is theirs is slightly different. I do think they are using the resting heart rate they're getting off the, the wrist. Why did I say which? That they get off the wrist and we call that the carbonin formula so that takes into account resting heart rate and then it does the math and it gives you kind of the same percentages 60 percent 70 percent 80 percent 90 percent and then up to 100 percent but they're using the carbonin formula so that is using your resting heart rate which a lot of exercise physiology shows that that's a little more accurate and don't worry, you don't have to memorize these formulas and all this and like 60% and all that. I'm going to go over that to make it like really simple to understand and teach you a cool way that I like to use that will help you with all this. That'll just make this very, very simple. But you do have to learn how to listen to your body better if you're going to get this little perk of learning how to do this with a lot more ease into that. Here is the problem with all of that though. So they are taking into consideration that everything is hunky-dory. And I don't mean health. Like maximal heart rate and all that has very little to do with your health. Maximal heart rate is age-dependent and genetic-dependent. That's it. It's not fitness-dependent. So somebody at 20 might have a lot higher maximal heart rate than another person at 20. It doesn't have anything to do with their fitness. It's just the way it is. Simply, we don't change our maximal heart rate when we train. So it's a very genetic thing and it is an age dependent thing, meaning that for the most part, after the age of 30, we tend to lose one heartbeat off of our max per year. And that's how they came up with the 220 minus your age formula that's most commonly used. And yes, it is still being used with the Apple Watches and Garmin from what I see. Here's the problem though that there is a huge standard deviation with that. In fact, studies show that that's only 66% accurate in the population, meaning that somebody 40 years of age should, based on this formula, have a maximal heart rate of 180, 220 minus age. So that's only true in 66% of the cases. That's a huge standard deviation. So 33% inaccuracy. How do you know if you're one of the lucky ones where your heart rates match up the way they should when you buy your Apple Watch? You don't. I mean, I guess you can go out and, you know, if it says that 90% for you is, say, 180 beats a minute and you're out there and you feel pretty taxed, well, that's probably pretty accurate. But the point is you do not know for sure unless you've had a maximal heart rate test done either by an exercise physiologist or a cardiologist for some reason. That's the only way you really know. More data shows that your target heart rates can be off by 15 beats in either direction. That's huge. 
So if, if your Apple Watch is telling you that your, say, your Zone 3 begins at 140, that's nice. But it really could be anywhere from 125 to 155 based on the science. So it's just a lot. There is just a lot of unknowns with this. Okay, that's what the science says. It says unless you have had your maximal heart rate tested. And basically, you could test that yourself. I mean, when you are going as hard as you can. So if you really pushed yourself in a 5K as hard as you can and you're finishing and you're crossing that finish line and you've had it elevated the entire race because you're really trying to do your best and then you sprint the final 100 yards or whatever, that's going to be your maximal heart rate. I mean, almost guaranteed. It's going to be so darn close. You don't have to worry about what it says it is in your watches. So that is one way. Or you have a professional do it where they ramp you up, which we call a ramp test which means every three minutes we raise the intensity a little bit until you get to a point you can't continue anymore. That's your maximal heart rate. Or if you're a little nervous about that and it's, you know, you talk to your cardiologist and they're going to do a stress test for whatever reason, sometimes you can get your data that way. But again, the only way we know is if we test it. These other ones are simply formulas. So, with that in mind, then all of the formulas were given or all of the 60%, 70%, 80%, 90%, 100% .00 are going to be off or we're just not sure if they're 100% accurate, right? So you, you can go and you can test it as I said and basically what they tend to use again is the 60% is considered around zone one. So in the language they use, they pretty much put it in your phone app as zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, and some others use zone six, and, and then there are others that use even less zones. But they are basing that off of 60% kind of being your baseline low as a zone one, and then as you get closer to 80%, that's going to be more like a zone Three, where you're getting higher end cardio, higher end aerobic, but you definitely have a lot more in the tank. And then when you get to zone four, that's going to be more like vigorous tempo threshold, meaning you're pushing it a little bit. You're not going to hold that as long. And then zone five is like maximal where you would do intervals and where you would do racing and things like that. So even though it's saying zones, it's still using percentages of your maximal heart rate. Now, Here's the best way to do that. So I like to tell people to kind of think of this like they're driving a manual transmission, sort of, you know, it, it, bear with me. I, I, I'm just going to keep going with this and I'm going to explain it. So think that you're driving a car, all right, a manual transmission. Think that you have five gears. Think of it that way. But, but to use this, you really have to listen to your body and understand what we call the rate of perceived exertion or RPE. That is one of the best ways to really learn your cardiorespiratory zones. That is one of the best, if not the best ways. In fact, in exercise science, studies have shown that people that are trained to use their RPEs can nail it to the percentage. There was a treadmill test done where they taught people what things are supposed to feel like, like what, what are they supposed to be aware of in certain zones, like say 70 to 80%, their breath rate's gonna feel like this, they're gonna bear, they're actually at 70%, they're gonna carry on a conversation very well, they're gonna have some level of perspiration, blah, 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 so they teach them. And then they test them, and they, they can see the heart rate monitors, but the participants can't. And then they ask them, say, okay, so, 30 minutes into it, what heart rate are you at? What, what percentage are you at? And they would nail it within just a few beats. Once they test, once they train them, taught them what it should feel like, RPE became so accurate. And I can attest to that. I mean, I can be out running and it's just experience or I can be cycling. Like it, it's very sport dependent too, but it doesn't matter. Any, in any event, I could be out walking. And if someone were to say to me, what heart rate do you think you're at? I mean, I can nail it within five easy. If I'm walking, I can nail it 
maybe within two. If I'm running, I'm going to nail it within five. I mean, I'm going to be really, really close because I know how I feel. Like I know what it feels like. And that's what I'm trying to teach you. This is the method to the madness today. That So the method is going to be how do we use RPE and my gear shifting little technique I like to use. And the madness is the reason why is because we can't trust all of the zones that the companies have given us. Not that they're trying to deceive us, just they don't know and they're just trying to do the best they can to give you some level of an idea and now you need to take it from there. So what we need to do is learn what this feels like. So zone one or gear one is basically your zone one. It's gonna be somewhere around 60%. It's gonna feel really, really light. It's just gonna feel like what we call active rest exercise. It's really good to help you recover. Studies show that zone one and zone two training will help you recover better than taking the day off. So you just go out for a nice long walk, easy pace. What's it gonna feel like? It's gonna feel easy. It's just gonna feel easy. And that's usually around 60% of your maximum heart rate for most people. So for me, that's like around 100 beats or so. That's like my zone one. I'm in gear one. I'm just cruising. I don't need to go any faster. I'm just out there recovering. Let's say you're doing interval running, like you're doing a Galloway type of thing where you run, walk, run, walk. So after you run and you walk for your minute or whatever you do, that's going to be like in zone one. You're just allowing your body to recover. Then you shift to zone two. You, you go to gear two. So we're coming up on race week here in Daytona, right? We're, we're really close to the Daytona 500 and all the races that we have in our area. So think of it that way. You're out in your car, you're cruising, you're racing, you're thinking about the races that are going to be coming on. And now you downshift or no, you upshift to, to gear two, to zone two. And basically what that is, is that's getting around 70%. How does that feel? Well, it obviously feels a little harder than zone one because 70% is going to be harder, but it's gonna feel a little more elevated. Your heart rate's gonna come up some, and this is gonna be the zone that you do like a lot of long, slow distance cardio in. You're gonna get out there and maybe do a 60 minute walk or so in this zone. It still feels easy. You can carry on a conversation. You could even sing, you could whistle in zone two. Now you're still getting a cardiovascular benefit. That's what's cool about all this. Like you're going to get cardiovascular benefits in every one of these zones. Now below zone one, you're probably not going to get a lot. Studies show that if we're not elevated above 60%, we tend to not get the benefits. So, you know, we have to keep that in mind. There is a minimal level of intensity and studies also show that the more fit you are, the higher you need to train closer to your maximal heart rate or maximal VO2 max. So, you know, there's that. And then, of course, when that becomes the thing, then we can't train as frequently because we could get injured if we're training at a high intensity or we can get an overuse injury if we're doing it every day. So we have to learn to balance that. But that's for another day and another time. So zone two is still feels easy. We can whistle. We can sing. We can go real long. Maybe we're listening to this fantastic podcast as we're walking down the beach and doing a nice four mile walk in this zone. We're still recovering. We're burning fat, by the way. So exercise physiology states that in zones one and two, your primary fuel source is going to be fat. It's going to be minimal carbohydrates, although some are being burned. So it's a great pace if you're training for a physique, a physique contest, which I have a few, not a few now, but a client now that is training for one. And I've had many clients in the past that have. So it's a great zone for them to burn body fat in because they're sparing their muscle tissue and they're only burning fat. So that's pretty cool. That's zone one and two. It feels easy. Now zone three, the moderate zone, like so many people don't train moderately that it drives me nuts. I used to go around and say more moderation, which people look at me like, isn't that an oxymoron? More moderation. It's like, if it's moderation, it can't be more. That's why I did it. I want it to stick more moderation. Like we have people that go at a super low intensity all the time and they never train above it. And that's better than nothing. I get it. But they never get into that third gear. You know what I mean? They're getting dropped from the pack, getting back to the racing analogy. They're kind of driving through the pits, but they never get any faster. So, I mean, I'd love to see people step it up a little. 
And then you get your hammerheads that train in like zone five all the time because they're type A's and they don't understand the value of shifting down and driving easier sometimes. They don't get it. So they don't train in zone three a lot. They don't get into that moderate zone, which is such a beautiful zone. You're burning fat, you're burning carbohydrates, you're getting a great aerobic intensity. So you're getting some uh, cardiovascular hypertrophy, which is a good thing in a good way. And you're getting the endorphins buzzing. That's where you get like a lot of the aerobic highs and all. So zone three is awesome. And it's around like 180, 180. It's around 80%. So for me, that's like around 130. That was what I did this morning. I went to the pickleball slam last night with uh, some great people and uh, it was awesome, but I got home at 3 a.m. and I tell you what, I was dragging Fanny this morning, but I wanted to get in and get on the bike and do some moderate training to get my heart rate up a little bit. I felt so much better afterwards. So that feels like you're working a little bit, but you're still in control. Your heart rate is coming up, but it's not really getting too fast yet. It's a very comfortable pace. You can probably still go for a very long time in zone three. Most people can. Uh, it's not really racing. It's not going that hard. You can still carry on a conversation. You can still talk. You can still sing even a little bit if that's what you're into. But it's you can't just sit there and yammer, yammer, yammer. So I'm, I'm talking about the speaking thing a lot because that's how a lot of people measure their cardiorespiratory, as we call that the talk test, like at what level can you have a conversation. In zone three, you can still talk, but it's not like you can just yammer on and on and on because you are taking some breaths in between. This is how we know what zone that you're actually in. It's a beautiful zone, zone three. All right, so again, it's around 80%. Feels comfortable. I guess that's the best way to put it. You feel comfortable, doesn't feel easy, doesn't feel hard. It's basically the highest point you can go and still be very aerobic, all right? Zone four is what we call threshold. That's where we start to pick it up a little bit. We, we call that vigorous in the exercise science world. That means it's slightly above aerobic. It's vigorous. We're getting our heart rate close to 90%, which may sound to novices as super high, but aerobic athletes can hold 90% for a long time. I mean, they can hold that for a marathon. So 90%... Seems really, really high, and it is high, but it is sustainable. Like you can hold that for a long period of time. I'm not saying it's good to necessarily, because remember, more moderation. We don't want to hold it that long because we simply don't need to. We're getting the cardiorespiratory benefits around 30 minutes or so. We don't have to keep holding it. We just kind of have to dance in that zone a little bit and then come out of it. All right. Now, if you're not really training for endurance events, you might not need to, to venture into zone four a whole lot. Although it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to do some aerobic pickups, we call it. So if you're out there like really power walking and learning the jog a little bit, it could be where you just kind of like pick it up for a quarter mile and push a little bit. Get breathless. We start to hyperventilate in zone four, meaning we're not able to just carry on a conversation that goes on and on and on. We can still speak in, in bits and pieces, but... We're not going to be able to carry on a conversation. We know we're in zone four. So we are hyperventilating a little bit and we're not comfortable anymore. Now we call this somewhat hard. It's not really comfortable. So it is, it is gearing up. You're in zone four. You're cruising. You're almost at max speed. But guess what? You got one more. Gear five or zone five. And that's all out. That's where you would be racing at. So towards the end of a 5K, towards the end of a bike race, towards the end of a triathlon swim event, whatever. It is when you're maxed out, like you are around 95% or higher of your capacity. You can't go any higher. You are not comfortable. You cannot, you can speak, maybe grunt, and you got to look a pain on your face. And that's where people do intervals at. And that's where athletes really, really push at. And again, if your goal isn't to be an endurance athlete or whatever, you probably don't have to spend a lot of time there. It may be unnecessary for you. Although again, if you enjoy intervals, there's nothing wrong with it either. Some people have asked, well, isn't it dangerous? The answer is no. I mean, the only time aerobic conditioning can be even remotely dangerous is if you have a pre-existing condition and your cardiologist told you not to do that. But other than that, it's not like you can work yourself into a problem like that. You have to have a pre-existing condition. Your body will simply slow yourself down before you get into any trouble. So I hope I maybe put some minds at ease right there. 
Having said that, it is not comfortable. It hurts. So I did a 5K over the weekend and it was a lot of fun. It was a great event. It was the Me Strong and Deland. Saw some clients there. And, uh, you know, towards the end of that, I was definitely like in zone five. Now, unfortunately, I was wearing my Garmin, which is really good for uh, the picking up the pace and everything. But this Garmin particularly isn't very good with my heart rate. So, you know, it wasn't showing me the right number. I know it was higher than it was saying it was. It said it was super low. I like, yeah, I wish. I'm not Superman with that by any means. So, but I, I know I was in zone five because I was huffing and puffing and I was working and that's actually why I like to do 5Ks because then I'm doing hard things, which makes me feel accomplished. So I hope this tidies things up a little bit. If you have any questions, please hit me up. Um, again, this podcast is about using science, trying to help you understand things that are out there. And speaking of understanding, I want you to understand there is no better garage door company than Overhead Door of Daytona Beach. I personally vouch for Jeff and Zach Hawk. I've known them. I've known Jeff for 30 years. I mean, they're simply the best product. They are the best service. If you need any help, give them a shout at OverheadDoorDaytona.com. Please remember to download these because it really helps me with my numbers and share them. If you like what you hear, Send it to friends, you know, help me out, help you out, help them out. Until next time, be max fit and be max well.